Hi everybody, this is Guru Fresh, this is Big Boy Screamador, and today's another episode of Bayani Talk. Hi everybody, this is Guru Fresh, this is Big Boy Screamador, and today's another episode of Bayani Talk. I'm actually releasing this video on both on all on both channels, 413 Media Group as well as Filipino Martial Arts School, because this is such an important, important video. Um, I'm releasing this on April 27th, uh, 2021. So this is the, the, the 500th and 500th anniversary of the Battle of Mactan Island. And because of that, I have a special, special a guest. I interviewed a professor, Danny Girona, who is a Filipino history, a professor and a Filipino historian that specializes in the story of, 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 of Magellan and Lapu Lapu. And we had a wonderful, wonderful Zoom uh, appointment meeting. And I think you guys are going to get a kick out of this um, because not only is this a part of our Filipino history, but it's also part of our Filipino uh, martial arts history. And, you know, being this on April 27th, 500 years after the Battle of Mactan Island, this makes it even a special, a special video. And what makes it even more special is April 27th is my birthday. So, yes, I've always, you know, somehow I've definitely been kind of been, in, you know, involved within this, this moment of time more than, any, than anything else. And when you watch this video, you'll actually see that, that, that I might have some a lineage connection to it. So enjoy the video. Uh, Professor Danny Girona is an amazing, amazing uh, and very highly intelligent, um, uh, you know, professor and historian. Uh, and enjoy the video. So hi, this is uh, Guru Francis from Filipino Martial Arts School and 413 Media Group. I'm here with Professor Danny Giro uh, Danny, and um, and we're here to talk about Lapu Lapu and the connection to Filipino martial arts. Professor, can you please introduce introduce yourself and and your background, please, sir? Yeah, I'm a Filipino historian. I did much of my work in the archives in Europe uh, in the places where, where uh, materials could be found about the expedition. Uh, um, uh, I did, of course, my, my doctorate on, is on um, the early colonial Philippines. I did more on the hermeneutics of power. So I analyzed power in the context of, uh, of language. I, I analyze, my, my area is uh, 17th, um, 16th and 17th century, but uh, in the early contact period with the natives and the Spanish missionaries. So I did much of my work on arch archival documents. I examined sermons and uh, prayer books of the 17th century. But uh, in the course of my research, Francis, in the Archivo General de Indias, I discovered uh, large volumes of documents on Magellan virtually untouched by mm -hmm. scholars for mm -hmm. the last probably 500 years. So right. A lot of documents. Yeah, so I started working on that after my dissertation. So I had to go back to Europe uh, almost every other year to do uh, to comb the archives of Archivo General de Indias, Biblioteca Nacional, Valladolid, uh, wherever there are Pilipiniana materials. So that's how my journey to Magellan uh, began as a, as a scholar. And since then, I started giving, uh, got to be invited to meet in fact with the King of Spain. Uh, wow. to begin, yeah, yeah, to begin the the celebration of the 500 years. Uh, there are about 50 historians all over the world in, who are experts on Magellan, and they were mm -hmm. uh, invited by the king, the Ministry of Defense uh, of Spain. And um, I met with the Secretary General of the UNESCO because he's also interested in uh, peace, in some way, peace studies. And he saw in my book, when he read my book, because I launched it in Madrid, um, he was a Spaniard, by the way, um, he read that somewhere there in the chapter in the book, I talk about uh, Bartolome de las Casas, the one who is responsible for um, uh, complaining about the abuse of the Spaniards in South America. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that, that, that's it. And I got to be invited to uh, the University of Seville, uh, Lisbon, uh, Geographic Society, and mm -hmm. other parts of Europe to give talks on uh, the, Span the expedition to the Philippines by the Vagellans. Wow, that's that's yeah. wow, impressive and very impressive, Professor. Thank you very much for sharing that. So let's start off with something. You know, there's been many speculations within the Filipino martial arts community. What was Magellan's real reason to come to the Philippines? Now, I, I attended your 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 online lecture with uh, last December, and there was you know there was a couple myths going out. What what in your most ex expert opinion opinion? Excuse me. What was Magellan's real motivation to actually try to circumnavigate the world and go to the Philippines? Yeah, that's quite an interesting question, Francis. I think first, 
and foremost, Magellan did not intend to circumnavigate the world. Apparently, that's not the purpose of Magellan. Wow, okay. Yeah, yeah. The, the, you have to understand that Magellan was a former sailor under the Portuguese. Right. And for that reason, yeah, as early as uh, 11 years before he landed in the Philippines, 15, 1510, 1511, mm -hmm. he was already in Malacca, in Singapore. Uh, wow. they, yeah, they established a foothold in Singapore, uh, mm -hmm. the, the Portuguese, um, because of the fact that the Portuguese were in search of spices. Right. They were, yeah, uh, and again, this, there's, a myth, there's a myth there uh, for a long time, Francis, that we always thought that uh, the Europeans were interested in spices because it makes their food taste better. I think that's a very, very shallow reason. Imagine right. you are going to spend millions uh, of, of money in some way. Right. Right. sacrifice the lives of people just to make your food taste better. I don't think that's the, that's the real uh, reason. I think the real reason behind that, and of course some of the works today on uh, spice uh, research are now coming up with this theory, that the main reason for spices is because it's power. Power because anybody who has spices can, does not make, okay, it makes your food taste better, but there is a more important reason for that. Right. The reason is because it preserves your food. Right. We do not have a refrigeration system at the time. Of so course. anybody who can, uh, who can preserve your food can travel far. And anybody who can travel far can discover more lands. And right. anybody who discover more lands, discover more resources. And therefore, you control the world in the process. And wow. that's the reason why yeah, the Portuguese were in search of spices. At first, they thought spices were actually produced in India. Uh -huh. But they realized that they, they, when they were already in India, they realized from the, from the uh, Hindu merchants that they, India was only a transit point of spices coming from Malacca. Oh, wow. But so, yeah, when they entered Malacca, when the Portuguese uh, colonized Malacca, uh -huh. they also realized later on that Malacca is another transit point of <laughs> spices. Right. Because the real source of spices was the Spice Islands, which is east of Malacca, which is now Indonesia. Uh -huh. And that's the reason why, while Magellan was there, and three other captains of the Portuguese, it is said, by the chroniclers of the 16th century, uh -huh. they decided to travel east, apparently without any official recognition from the king of Portugal. Okay. So when they traveled east, then they realized that there are actually clusters of islands to the east that they never learned before. Oh, they, wow. only thought, yeah, they only thought that the end of the, of the uh, eastern route was, the, was uh, Malacca. Malacca, That's, right. Yeah, they were familiar with that. But then they never realized that there were a group of islands east of Malacca, and uh -huh. that's where the Spice Islands were. Right. And it is said that Magellan and three other uh, Portuguese captains had traveled there, learned of the presence of these, and one of them was actually... Uh, a friend of him, Francisco Sirao, was apparently interested to settle there anywhere, not to return to Portugal because of the tremendous wealth of the territory. And Magellan, it is said, some sources, 16th century sources, claim that Magellan, in fact, penetrated north of that Spice Islands and reached as far as the Philippines. Imagine as early as 1511. Wow. So Magellan, yeah, Magellan learned of the Philippines as early as that. That's right. the reason why Francis, when he returned to Portugal and he complained to the king of Portugal, King Manuel, that he needs this to be compensated because contrary to popular belief, Francis, that Magellan looks like a, a soldier. Mm -hmm. He's actually a very, very short guy, a short stature guy, probably okay. five footer, yeah? Right, right, okay. And he was actually limping. He was oh, limping. Wow. Not, yeah. So when he went to the Philippines, he was actually limping. The reason is because his foot was shattered in the battle in North Africa. Why? Because North Africa was a Portuguese territory. And because of that, he wanted to claim for his compensation for his uh, injury. Right. But the, the Portuguese king, instead of giving him his uh, what he was wanting, he was condemned. He was there because there were a typical uh, case of uh, the politics of envy. Magellan was complained by some officers in, in, in posted in North Africa that he, because he was supposed to be a quartermaster in that field, in that area there in Africa, it is said that he sold, I think, 200 or 2,000 cows 
and he kept the money for himself oh, as wow. part of the yeah, part of the war booty uh -huh. in North Africa. And the king apparently heard of that, so he accused Magellan for uh, stealing money that belongs to the royal treasury. Right. And so Magellan was very angry and decided to change his allegiance, went to Spain, uh -huh. and there, there he presented his proposal. <laughs> apparently, mm -hmm. the proposal came from his knowledge of his uh, journey in 1510. So Magellan had actually a, a secret. And right. at the time, Francis, geographic secrets are valuable. Of course. Uh, secrets. Yeah. The routes, the routes yeah. are, I mean, the because, routes, yeah. you know, just, I mean, just to go in line with what you were saying, Professor, if, if the spices were, food, were power to preserve yeah. the food, right? Yeah. That means yeah. if they can find the safest, shortest route from point A to point B, that's they're right. going to keep that that's, to themselves. That's they're, right. That, that's that's a, right. right. Yeah. That and you have to understand, Francis, the longer the route, the higher the price because it will be jacked up by the different transit points that they're going to be uh, that they would get the the, the, the spices so anybody who can who can find the shortest route right could uh, apparently get the monopoly of the spices in europe and right. you would be selling that at the same price but at a lower uh, cost of uh, purchase of course so, of course yeah yeah, of course so it's, it's standard economics right like yeah you know, that's right you know uh, if if he can if he can produce or get this, this, the materials at a lower rate and then, and then right. the market value still hands it at the higher rate then of That's course right. he, will, he will maintain that and then keep his and then the, there's less overhead and then more profit margin that's right that's right that, that, makes, that makes total sense yeah. that makes total sense yeah. so so as far as you were saying now professor um magellan's real real um uh purpose was you know to to maintain some sort of naval uh, advantage over his competitors, uh, you know, in getting the spices. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. And that's the other thing, of, of course, Francis, is the, the Portuguese, the, the Spanish king, because he now ch uh, shifted his allegiance from right. Portugal to Spain. Spain. The Spanish king at that time was, of course, very, very much interested also on spices. The reason, Francis, I think, uh, that this is the problem of Philippine history. Most of our books in Philippine history were very, very, uh, have looked at our, the, uh, the history of Magellan expedition in a very, very narrow perspective. They only right. look at it uh, as an event in the Philippines, failing to realize that it has previous uh, yeah, causes and it, the, 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 the causes, the reasons behind the launching of the expedition could only be understood in the context of the European economics and European politics of the time. One thing, Francis, that I, I, I tried to change in the, in the Magellan Annals is this. That the king of the, at the time, uh, uh, Charles the First, was a very very young king, and he was a newly installed the uh, king okay. of Spain. Yeah, he was barely seventeen years old. Right. He was just new in uh, in Spain. And what is interesting, he was not a Spaniard. Oh wow! He, yeah, he was Flemish. Oh. He was from uh, Flanders, uh -huh. uh, Germanic in some way, and uh -huh. that was not a trouble for him. Sure. Um, but was. The, the Spaniards didn't like him because he could not even speak Spanish. Right. And so what problem? He does not know the uh, the culture of the Spaniards. Right, right. And I doubt, apparently, because you have to understand in the, 15, in the 16th century, Francis, Germany was the hotbed of Protestantism. Mm -hmm. And apparently, the, the Spaniards are very, very pious and very, very right. solid Catholics. Right. So these are certain apprehensions. But why is it that Charles who was only very few months a king of uh, Spain, who even uh, had been there or uh, seated in the throne for a few months, immediately approved the proposal of Magellan. Well, because, the reason, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Because the I, reason, go ahead, sorry. <laughs> okay, 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 sure. The reason, Francis, is, of course, uh, his father, Maximilian, who was, of course, the king at the time, uh, uh, Burgundy, uh, part of Germany and uh, in Belgium, they were interested, they had always been in contact with a German banker, the Fugger, Jakube Fugger, uh -huh. who was he earned so much wealth, one of the earliest, let's say, insurance guy in the world at the time, who earned so much wealth in textile, in gold mining, and eventually shifted to spices. Wow. So here is a guy who is now expanding his business venture. Yeah. yeah? And the king, his, uh, Maximilian, the father of Charles, had always been indebted. Ironically, imagine here is a king who borrowed money from an, a banker, an right. insurance guy. And for that reason, when Charles eventually assumed the throne of Spain, 
he also wanted he also involved this man uh, in his trade in, uh, in the investment actually the Magellan expedition is an investment of Yakubi Fugger because he invested so much money right. contrary to popular belief that is actually financed exclusively by the king of Sweden. That's not true. Mm -hmm. The money is borrowed from Yakubi Fugger and he would get some percentage once they discovered spices in the East. Wow. And that's one of the purpose of the Magellan expedition. So that makes total sense because, I mean, if I was King, you know, king Charles I, he, you know, the Spanish people hates him. Him using yeah. personal, you know, the the funds of the of uh, uh, of the country would yeah. probably look bad on him, especially since they don't trust him to begin with. That's so, true. That's so true. he tapped into his father's resources, That's you know, true. which is this German banker, and yeah. said, "Okay, well, listen, you'll keep most of the money. Just give me a little percentage." But I become he becomes the popular one within his country to find another route and source for spices that Magellan That's right. can provide. That's right. That's right. That's, That's, right. That's very very geopolitical. Very true. geopolitical, true. even true. back then, you know, even back then. That's that's absolutely amazing. So now you mentioned about when. So now he he gets to the Philippines. Yeah. Right? And was there uh is there a lot of spices that he can that he can uh get from them? Was Philippines no. a source? Well, there were only cinnamon that they they found cinnamon in some clusters of islands in the Visayas, Francis. Uh, uh -huh. But while they were already there in um in the Philippines. Apparently, Magellan knew his destination. His destination was actually the Spice Island. Okay. He only stumbled upon the Philippines from uh, the Pacific Ocean, that's their first landfall. And eventually, he already was aware of where he was going to. In fact, this is again another aspect of Magellan history, Francis, has never been explored, but I saw the primary document. When Magellan was about to leave Spain, he sent a memorial to the king telling him exactly the clusters of islands, of the Spice Islands, where he was going to. So wow. it's far from what we have learned in history for a long time, that Magellan uh -huh. didn't know where he's going, that's not true. He left a certain document to Charles telling him, this is my direction. This is where I would go because there, this is where spices could be found. So when they stum he stumbled on the Philippines, he probably thought this is only part of the clusters of island right. on the other side, on the, yeah, on the northeastern part of the Spice Islands, where he was already familiar and apparently because he had already made a landfall even in some parts of the Philippines. So right. he was he was concerned with going to to uh, to the Spice Islands, but then when he stumbled on Cebu, he realized that there are resources in Cebu which he never thought exist for example because of that because he always was concerned with the uh, spices and what is what is it that he found in Cebu? gold gold not not because Cebu has um, has uh, gold by itself but because Cebu acquired gold because it is the trading center of the philippines if you look at the map it's located at the center of the philippines and all the foreign vessels coming to Cebu coming to the philippines would duck in Cebu because Cebu was a major trading center. And precisely, the chieftain of Cebu, Humabun, was not a warrior. He was a merchant. Right. That's precisely, yeah. I that's precisely. That in your lecture. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's amazing. So, Go ahead, Professor. Okay, okay, Francis. Yeah. No, I mean, I just I just think that that's absolutely amazing that there was so many things that was, Parambang, it's like the Philippines was just, was just there almost yeah. and then it became part of a geopolitical uh you know a hub and everything now i can only imagine that if La if magellan was was you know traveling towards the, the spice islands and then he ran into the philippines he probably said well wow, this is a safe place for me to to uh to hang out especially if humambon was a merchant not a warrior so yeah. as a merchant that means he's a businessman meaning he's thinking how do i profit from this that's true. Right. How do precisely. I profit from this? Yeah, precisely, Francis. In fact, there was a, an eyewitness document, an eyewitness, uh, eyewitness account. He says that Magellan apparently whispered to him that he, but he was already contented to settle in Cebu. The reason, Francis, is this. Again, there's another, uh, 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 another aspect of Magellan which has never been explored by historians. I saw the document in Seville in which it says there in the so-called asiento or capitulacion, capitulacion in the 16th century Spanish means contract, contract between Charles and Magellan, that Magellan discovered beyond six islands, 
uh-huh. the other islands would belong to him. He oh, becomes wow. the owner, yeah, of the islands. Oh, Aside wow. from the salary he gets. Okay. So, he, yeah, so that's precisely. And he saw that there are clusters of islands in the Philippines. Right. And he was so fascinated by Cebu and the neighboring islands of that area, Limasawa and all those things, and Humunhon. And he saw that there were enormous treasure there, especially gold. And for that reason, he says he's contented to settle in, in Cebu. But okay. then, of course, he was looking at Cebu as, again, as a transit point for the conquest of the Spice Islands because they were, he was away. That was very, very near. In fact, he already found a native who was going to drive, the hood, who was going to guide them to, uh, to the Spice Islands after Cebu. But unfortunately, he was killed in the battle. Right. Okay. So then let's, let's talk about um, Lapu Lapu, uh, Professor. Um, yeah. Now, it, within the Filipino martial arts industry, um, they, they're, uh, you know, most Filipino styles, um, uh, most Filipino schools directly likes to link themselves to Lapu Lapu himself. Like, yeah. because, yeah. I mean, the biggest, the biggest, uh, one of the biggest myths that, was, yeah. that was, was shared within the Filipino martial arts community was that Lapu Lapu used his Filipino martial arts style, whatever, whatever that style may be, to, to, um, to repel Magellan's men and, and their attack on Mactan Island. Um, yeah. Is there any evidence of what Lapu Lapu style looks like? Do we have any historical, archaeological, written, uh, you know, uh, uh, pieces that, that that supports that? Yeah, that's, also, that's an interesting question, Francis. I think uh, there's one thing I could say that Lapu Lapu is an enigmatic person. He's an enigma in Philippine history and probably right. in world history. And in my case. Anybody who is famous but whose life is enshrouded in enigma right. becomes a target for myth, for production of myths and fictionalization. Right. And that's precisely the case of Lapu Lapu. But how much do we know about Lapu Lapu? Right. Virtually very little. Right. One thing you have to understand, Francis, in the context of the of Magellan historiography is this. Nobody had seen Lapu Lapu even from among the crew of Magellan. They probably heard about Lapu-Lapu from the natives, from Raja Humabon, from, mm-hmm. but probably they are not interested in uh, the, the, the picture of how uh, Lapu-Lapu looked like. They were only interested in the politics and the power Lapu-Lapu wielded right. in the context of the geopolitics in Bivisayan territory. That's right. precisely also the concern of Raja Humabon. Raja Humabon wanted to... Uh, establishes hegemony in the clusters of islands in the Visayas, but then he was opposed by Lapu Lapu, his other opponent. Right. Uh, of course, we know ironically uh, the issue is this: Lapu Lapu and Humabun were brothers-in-law. Uh, right. the, the, yeah, yeah. The, the, the sister of Lapu Lapu was married to Humabun, and the other thing is, aside from this family issue, there is another issue about them that they were there is a certain political uh, economic rivalry. Because of the fact that Lapu Lapu controlled the channel in Cebu, mm-hmm. uh, uh, any any foreign vessels going into Cebu would be charged by ta- uh, with taxes by Lapu Lapu, and for this reason, these people, the, the the foreign vessels would complain to Humabon when Humabon asked them for for well, taxes right. that they yeah. yeah they were already paying two taxes at the same time, right, and that's right. probably the reason why uh, Humabon was at odds with Lapu Lapu in that particular case. So essentially, Francis, we do not have uh, any uh, visual uh, you know, say, accounts as to Lapu Lapu was, even from among the Spaniards themselves. Because when the battle took place, there were thousands of them, 1,500 at least in the estimate, um, I would say an average estimate of the different chroniclers, 1,500 to 2,000 natives. How can you identify who the, who the leader there was? There was uh, I don't no think that. There was no name tag, right? So. Yeah, yeah, no name, name tag. They look probably the same. And uh, probably Lapu Lapu does not have a very, very prominent feature or it's at all or whatever. He was simply just like anybody there. And probably because you have to understand that the Spaniards were actually at uh, as far from them when they entered the, the, the coast of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Mactan, the, the shoreline of Mactan, there was already uh, arrows being uh, throw, uh, being shot at them. So right. it's very, very difficult, I think, to identify. What we know is the idea that we got about Lapu Lapu mostly came from the post Mactan battle narrative. Mm. Meaning to say, the accounts written after the battle of Mactan. Okay. 
Why? Much of the information we got came from the Portuguese. Right. The reason, Francis, is because when the survivors of the Magellan expedition in the ship Trinidad, there were two ships that survived, and one of them returned to Victoria, but the Trinidad was able to dock in Borneo, the Spice Islands, and the Spice Islands, as I've said earlier, it was a Portuguese territory. Right. So all of them were actually captured. Mm -hmm. And there are records in the expedition of Trinidad. Some of them were in uh, navigational reports, some of our eyewitness uh, diaries in some way. And that is where the Portuguese got hold of them. That's the reason why a more detailed picture of Lapu-Lapu, comparatively speaking, was written not by Spaniards, by the, but by the Portuguese chroniclers, okay. particularly Caspar Correa, who okay. told us that Lapu-Lapu was a very old man. And it's a reliable, considering the context of how the document was produced, because Gaspar Correa was the royal chronicler of Portugal at the time right. of the Magellan. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so that, it, it, I, yeah, it, I'm it, just saying, it, putting these accounts, from the information in the context for us to understand how, 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 what information could be relied upon in our understanding of who Lapu Lapu was. Or else we can have myths here because people can say, oh, right. this, this Lapu Lapu. This. But you have to. You have to put into context the data that you possess, or yeah, else I can see people the story. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. yeah, he can walk on water. You know, he that's can right. That's, true. that's right. He has that's a big right. ass in his chest. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, can, we can we can absolutely create these these uh, these myth legends. Uh, you know, with, yeah. with if, but we have to, of course, always base it upon the data that we have on hand. That's true. That's true. So that's true. now let's talk about the Battle of Mactan Island. Did that really happen? Yeah. Was there a real battle between Magellan's men and Lapu-Lapu's men? Did that really happen? Again, okay. it happened, Francis. But you have, again, to put that into context. Because, well, again, myth-making says that Magellan simply attacked the place. And he was so arrogant. He was so vainglorious at the power of Spain. So he apparently lost that sense of a, a calculation that the native forces were also equally powerful. Uh -huh. Equally, uh, yeah, well, uh, knowledgeable of war like Lapu Lapu, and he simply ignored that. Uh, apparently, that's the myth that circulated for the last 500 years. But right. we have to understand again, we have to put the context of the myth yes. of Lapu Lapu to understand the Battle of Mactan. We have to understand, Francis, that the myth about Lapu Lapu as uh, the, the background of Lapu Lapu as being the son of, Mag of, uh, uh, of uh, Mangal mm -hmm. and uh, that he came from Borneo, that he was Muslim. All of them came only about 1920s. Uh -huh. uh, a certain, a certain yes. local yes. guy wrote the yeah. legend, oh. and since then it circulated. It was picked up even by uh, by the historians at the time. 1919, right. there was the, one of the earliest, you might say, uh, biographical uh, entry on Lapu Lapu came around 1935. Okay. It's more, uh, this biography, uh, Francis, was actually relying exclusively on the Pigapeta account. But as I said, Pigapeta did not see Lapu-Lapu. So it's not very, very reliable, uh, much of the, uh, the accounts uh, in that particular context referring to Lapu-Lapu. Right. So by 1930s, we have a small biography of, of uh, Lapu-Lapu. Right. But then others who got a hold of these uh, this, uh, legends produced in 1920s uh, reproduced that and integrated that with a little information from Pigapeta mm -hmm. and some probably other information, secondary sources uh, written by the Spaniards, and created a blend of myth and historical facts. Right. Because that is the basis for the monument that right. the Philippine government built in 1969 right. during the time of Ferdinand Marcos. Right, right. Ferdinand Marcos was the one responsible for the construction of the um, uh, Lapu Lapu, yeah, Lapu -Lapu monument. Right. But that was actually derived, Francis, from the from the combination of legends and bit of historical facts written in the succeeding years, especially in 1970s, when the National Historical Institute produced also a biographical series which included Lapu Lapu. Uh -huh. But most of the information there actually were embedded in myths produced in oh, 1920s. Wow. wow. Yeah. So that's so the point. And so the the foundation of a lot of the of the, the lot of the common understanding of Lapu Lapu was based upon conjecture, conjectures, and yeah. of course 
as we know it, it's basically mythical. Yeah. Not just <laughs> mythical. Right, uh, right. Yeah. So what happened to the Battle of Mactan, if you go back a little bit, Francis, to the Battle of Mactan, what mm -hmm. really happened? Another myth is this idea of uh, the Spaniards were uh, simply uh, aggressive and they simply, because the because Sumabon uh, uh, complained of a certain chieftain who does not accept Spanish sovereignty, Magellan right. simply rushed the place. I don't think it happened that way. The reason is because by the 16th century, Francis, the, Pilip the Spaniards who s were sent to the Philippines were already equipped with the lesson from South America. Mm. One thing is we have to understand that by 1513, six years before the Magellan expedition was launched, uh -huh. there, was a, well, there was a document, a very important document in the history of the Spanish Empire, the so-called Leyes de Borgus. Okay. The Leyes de Borgus in 1513 is a document crafted in reaction mm. to the complaints Bright uh, Bartolome de las Casas about human rights violations. So, in fact, one of the fathers of human rights was Bartolome de las Casas, who was a Spanish Dominican. Mm. And he complained about this thing. So, the crown authorities crafted a certain policy governing what we might probably call today as the rules of engagement of any Spanish uh, conquistador. Okay. That you cannot simply attack any place without sufficient reason. Right. And what would this, talk, this, this principle, Francis, of Buen Guerra. This principle of Buen Guerra is good war or just war. Meaning to say, you cannot simply declare, you cannot simply attack a territory unless there is a sufficient reason for that. Right. And what is the sufficient reason for attacking a territory? If the person, if the chieftain and the village does not recognize, not Spanish sovereignty, but does not recognize Christianity. Mm -hmm. Meaning to say, they would not embrace Christianity. Mm -hmm. Because the argument is actually a re-echo of the argument of the Reconquista and the Inquisition. The Inquisition says that it's all right for you to suffer your body as long as your soul could be saved. Right. And that was also the, the principle applied in the, the, their uh, attack, their, uh, their, uh, their, you might say, uh, their assault or the, uh, the wars they would wage against the native society. Right. That they would only engage in war if the natives refused to be converted because after all, the intention is to save their soul. The body right. might suffer, that's okay, but not for eternal, uh, for the, the, the eternal, eternal die. Dam eternal damnation. Yeah. Right. Damnation. Yeah. So that's their obligation. It's more of governed by a higher, uh, higher reason for them. Right. So right. That's one thing. The other thing, Francis, is another part of these rules of engagement is the so-called requerimiento. Again, if you are a historian, you have to understand this legal system of Spain at the time. The requerimiento says that before you engage in war, you have to declare your intention. It's just like the, the Miranda rights. Right. Before I arrest you, I will tell you why you are being arrested and they what you can do. Right. Yeah. And the requerimiento says, Francis, like this. They would recite the history of the world beginning with the creation until the as uh, assumption of the king of Spain that he is there because God installed him to be there. Right. And therefore, he has an obligation to bring about the faith, to bring about salvation. So you have to accept him or else we will attack you. Right. And if that, so that's the whole. So there would be declarations. The moment they refuse, then the next step is to engage them in war. And that's what happened to, to Lapu-Lapu. Uh, Magellan sent several emissaries and he made an ultimatum by burning a certain village in the territory and yet Lapu-Lapu did not yield. So it's high time, according to him, that this, the law of Spain, should apply for this guy. So they attacked Mactan. Wow. So it, was, yeah. it wasn't just, I felt like I'm going to go attack Lapu-Lapu. <laughs> yeah, that's true. There, that's was, true. So there were certain steps that needed to be met. That's right. You know, that's right. Rules yeah, of engagement in a sense, right? That's right. Rules of that's engagement right. to be met before they can that's actually right. attack yeah. them. And then, and then now, Humambon, did he capitulate? Did he convert to Christianity? Humambon, yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, he, well, yeah, he was converted, but apparently he did not understand the articles of faith of Christianity. It was right. more a political expediency. Of course. I have yeah, I have to accept this faith to establish alliance with uh, with uh, Magellan, and because right. that by by being friend with Magellan, I can settle accounts with the chieftains that do not accept my authority and right. eventually build my own hegemony in that area of Visayas. Right. So I mean, I can understand that. I mean, 
most people um, don't even understand the nuances of the theology of Christianity, let That's alone right. sailors that are coming from Spain that can, you know, that are probably not as literate into the theology of it. They're not, they're not really right. going to explain the theology of Christianity to somebody. They're going to explain to them how the political power of Spain has and, right. and the expediency to be able That's to right. do this. So that That's makes total right. sense. So. So and then now we had talked about you had talked about it's also in your in your December 17th that you know Lapu Lapu was not Muslim um, because there was tattoos all over his body according to according yeah. to 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 the um, to the data that we have on hand and then that there was yeah. even uh, that they ate pigs which is yeah. definitely a Muslim will never ever do because it is definitely considered an unclean animal okay. right so what what religion or what faith system do you think Lapu Lapu practiced? At that time. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting point, Francis. Again, it has to be put in context by a historian. Yeah. There, were, there was a possibility that he was Muslim and he may not, not be. But we have to understand, because it's very difficult to really gauge exactly the validity of this particular claim, that he was Muslim, because today, the issue of being a Muslim or being not is actually has already fallen within a particular discourse, a particular politics. Right. Uh, for example, so among the Muslims in the Philippines, it became a rallying point of pride that the, the one who resisted uh, the Spaniards is actually their fellow Muslim. Right. But on the part of the, uh, and, and of course, that was also used, the idea of being a Muslim sometimes go, went back actually, Francis, to the 17th century, 16th century period. Right. Uh, even the Spaniards, some of them entertained the possibility, although not directly telling that Lapu-Lapu was a Muslim, but one of the chroniclers says that a certain portion there in Mactan was actually a Muslim village. Right. Well, again, why? Why was he saying that? One thing is, it would be good to promote the idea that Lapu-Lapu was Muslim because it justified their attack on the territory. Makes because sense. definitely, yeah, he would not kill because right. he was Muslim. Well, yeah, he belonged to a universal religion and therefore there's a certain pride on him part not to accept Christianity. That's one thing. Right. On the other hand, in some way, Nancy, the idea of uh, being a Muslim, as I said, does not make sense at all. Because you have to understand that Islam at the time was only located in the southern part, Mindanao, as a small portion, and on the northern part in Luzon, in Tagalog region, in, uh, yeah, in Manila. Right. And you have to understand that the Muslims of the 16th century were not interested in proselytizing the Islamic faith. Right. They were more engaged in trade rather than in proselytizing the faith in the Philippines. Right. So, and I think most of them were, of course, converted by those who were from, uh, the, uh, from Indonesia and from Malaysia. Right. And they were interested in looking at these territories rather than in going to the Philippines because they thought they are much inferior to us rather than the people who were from Malacca. So why convert them in the first place? We, we do not need them because trade is going to Malacca and to right. in, Indonesia. And right. so essentially... There is no sense in a way to believe that Lapu-Lapu was actually Muslim. All other logical evidences seem to run against this belief of his being a Muslim. Okay, so would his faith or religion or belief system be more similar to that of, of their northern brothers, the Igorots, who are, you know, animal, they believe in, in the spirit animals and everything? Like, most likely similar not only to Igorots Francis, but to the rest of the Visayans. In fact, in the succeeding expedition, for example, in the Loaiza expedition, and we get a little background of the post bactan event based right. on this report. The reason, France, is contrary to what we know, that all of the men of Magellan were killed in uh, all, some, uh, only 18 returned to, to Spain, the survivors, right. and so it was maybe circumnavigation. Actually, that's not true. There were some who were left behind in Cebu. At least eight of them were captured by the men of Humabon and were kept as prisoners in Cebu. And these were the ones who had experience of what was going on in Cebu after the Battle of Mactan and wow. after the massacre yeah, of the survivors of the Battle of Mactan. Right. And they were sold to the Chinese. At least that was the information received by the Luais expedition. And at least one of them was retrieved by the expedition. So the narratives about the event that happened in that place after the Battle of Mactan was taken from certain eyewitnesses belonging to the Spanish crew and interviewed by the succeeding expedition. So we get an information about that. And one of the information that we get about the Visayas at that time, Francis, so the 
inner uh, world of the Messiahs came from those who witnessed it, uh, the life of the Messiahs after Magellan left, after Magellan died, came from these people who told us that most of the Messiahs were actually animists. They, they worship their ancestral spirits. And most likely, if that was widespread throughout the Messiahs, I think Mactan would not be an exception to that. Right. Right. Yeah. right. That makes that makes total sense. That makes total sense. So so Lapu Lapu did ever did Lapu Lapu ever go after Humambon for, for sending yeah. you know very good question, Brad. Yes. Because of the fact that Humabun made an alliance with the with the Magellan mm -hmm. he, after the Battle of Mactan because he already won. Right. And Again, again, in the context of the time, France, although this is not recorded by the by the Spaniards, we learned of this by analyzing the psych, the cultural cultural first, the outlook of the of the designs at that time. For them, anybody who won in a battle against anybody they thought was superior is regarded as favored by the gods. Of course. So because of that, Lapu Lapu assumed that superiority in the minds of the chieftains of Cebu at that time, that he was favored by the God and right. he became invincible. And right. for this reason, he threatened Humabon this time. He said, oh, okay, I'm turning to you. Right. You turned against me. You uh -huh. supported my enemy. Right. Now I'm going to destroy you. Right. But then he made an offer, Francis. The offer is this. Who made will the offer? Who, who... Lapu -Lapu. Okay, okay. Lapu -Lapu, according to Gaspar Correa, made an offer like this, and even to Hines de Mapra. Hines de Mapra is a survivor, an eyewitness of the event. According to Hines de Mapra, Lapu-Lapu told Humabon that I'm going to give you my wealth. I'm going to give you my daughter for mar in, uh, in marriage uh -huh. because, after all, I am already old. Oh. Idea. So that's what we get from him, that he was old, he was wealthy, and his daughter is going to be presented to Humabon as his gift if Humabon would kill the remnants of the Spaniards. Oh, wow. So, yeah, Humabon organized a banquet uh -huh. and invited the survivors of the Magellan expedition. Right. And in the banquet, he killed 27 of those who joined in the banquet. Wow. It's like a scene from Game of Thrones. That's right. <laughs> That's right. That's the right. Or something like that. Yeah. They, That's right. So did he kill them by poison or did he kill them by just... No, they, they, they ambushed them. They oh, am wow. There was a certain kind of a banquet, most probably at lunchtime, and the men of Humabon were already uh, deployed in the bamboo uh, plantations. Yeah. yeah, the area there where they put up a certain kind of a, uh, a banquet place, an area, um, and all the people were already deployed. They were hidden behind these bamboo uh, plants. Right, and right. when they were about to eat, they rushed into these people and killed them. Wow. Yeah. So did, did Lapu Lapu keep his word? Did he give him his wealth and his daughter? We never knew about that anymore. Wow. Francis. That's one interesting thing. I think uh, hopefully we and we don't know. Somewhere probably in the archives of, a, of a Torre de Tombo in Portugal, because there, it's interesting, Francis, the documents, the books about the 16th century in the Torre do Tombo in Lisbon, according to the archivist there when I did my research for two times, he said, we have not cataloged at least 10 kilometers more of documents and wow. books. <laughs> so until now, yeah. So, so probably there's somewhere there's, there. There's, yeah, I, mean, I mean, now, okay, I'm, this is complete conjecture. You know, La, Paul, we know Lapu Lapa goes, he did that so that the Spaniards will be the one coming after Humambon and he doesn't have to go after him anymore. That's probably, that's another strategy, yeah. Uh, that's you know, strategy. I mean, because, I mean if, if Lapu Lapu was indeed a strategist, I mean, he, I think you said, right. you guys mentioned this on the December 17th lecture, that yeah. he was, if Humambon was a merchant, Lapu Lapu was a, was a warrior. Uh, that's right, a, a, that's a right. In, in a that's spirit. right, so that's right. He would actually have that militaristic mindset. Precisely, Francis. Being, Precisely. being a chieftain, he's also politically mindset, you know? Yeah, right. Precisely. So, in fact, Francis, historically, at least meaning to say that based on documents, we know of certain hints that Lapu-Lapu was a strategist. Yes. One thing, one document says that Lapu-Lapu sent a spy to Cebu. Sent a spy to Cebu when they learned that Magellan and Humabon were planning to attack Mactan. Right. Yeah, they they learned they sent an exp uh, a spy and were trying to to see what were the plans 
of Magellan in regard to the invasion of Bactan. Right. That's one thing. The other thing, Francis, and probably may, very, many, very few knew about this thing, when Lapu-Lapu prepared for the attack of Magellan, they dug up holes, traps, in the coastline of Mactan. Okay. And in that, those uh, holes, they put up bamboo stakes, oh apparently, as, as traps. traps for the Spaniards. Yeah. Booby so, traps. Booby traps, yeah. What is interesting, Francis, is the strategy of Lapu-Lapu. Yes. So he, he, one thing, he did. He told Magellan not to attack them while still it's dark. Probably Magellan uh, positioned his ship about two or three o'clock in the morning. Right. And Lapu-Lapu sent an emissary to Magellan, begging Magellan not to attack them because the Lapu-Lapu claimed they were not yet prepared. They were waiting for reinforcement. But in reality, Lapu-Lapu was telling that because he wanted to tell Magellan that we are not yet prepared, so please, you may attack us because right. we are not yet prepared. Because, uh, and that precisely, the idea is, to in a way implicitly right. inform Magellan, yeah, yeah that oh, we are not prepared. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> so, now, yeah. yeah, but that's the point is he wanted him to attack Magellan because Magellan would not know of the traps there. He was dark, and the, he would not, yeah, you know, in that particular war, the Spaniards were familiar with positional wars. Of course, but the natives were, were more familiar with jungle warfare. Jungle warfare, warfare, yeah, warfare and, exactly. yeah, it's more so of an was, ambush. So that was the one of the things that I got. As far as, and of course, 1,000% conjecture that yeah. Lapu Lapu was definitely a, a, a strategist. That's right. That's because right. Because of the mere yeah. fact that, first of all, from what I understand about European style of warfare, yeah. they, they like to soften up the enemies by That's establishing right. a foothold on, on the beach, right? That's right. So yeah. now, I mean, I didn't know about the booby traps. I, you, I yeah. just, you just educated me right now. But yeah. I could only imagine that if they were trying to establish a foothold, that they cannot yeah. just bring it off the ship and then put it on the beachhead. Yeah, they yeah. have to carry it from the ship and drag and then take it to the water. Now, of course, those times, the firearms of those times cannot get wet. That's right, that's right. They, they cannot get wet, yeah. so they have to carry yeah. it above their heads. That's right, that's and then, right. So, and then, of course, as as the I mean as, as while they were still I mean the paintings that you found that we that, that we have on, on on the battle they were fighting on the water not on the beach. That's and, right. That's and right. Then, which yeah. made it very difficult for the Spaniards who have rifles that can't get wet they can't use yeah. it. It yeah. was it was completely it was completely ineffective for them and yeah. of course the cannons of the ship cannot yeah. shoot uh, because they're gonna hit their own yeah. men. They're gonna hit their own men yeah. and. and so yeah. that's why Lapu Lapu, you know, I think I think you I think there was write, writings on how they were dressed, the way that's that Lapu right. Lapu's men were dressed. They were dressed in loincloth. That's right. It made it sound very very uh, I don't know, backwards or very very that's tribal. Right. But if yeah. you look at it from a strategy, militaristic strategy point of view, they were wearing light clothing, so that's, that's right for them to maneuver in the water. That's precisely precise. And you have to understand, Francis. That the Spaniards were fully armored at the time. Exactly. Yeah, it so it's so heavy. Heavier. That's right. That's right. Every step that they, I mean, it's really hard enough to walk on the beach. Yeah. Know? And then, but then fully, wear fully armor, it's absolutely impossible. So he. And again, and again, Francis, you have to understand, you have to understand the terrain of yes, Maxan Island at that course. time. In fact, the place where they were Magellan lured, Magellan actually, uh, no, sorry, Napulapu lured the Spaniards yes. into a territory. Which is known as Pangusan at the time, and if you know the terrain of Pangusan even until today, it's actually coral reefs, uh, stricken oh, with wow. coral reefs. So oh, it's very wow. difficult, yeah, to, to, to stand. Go. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's they're very difficult to stand, and it's very big. Yeah, of course, Lapu Lapu's men know the terrain. That's right. They yeah. know the terrain better than Magellan's men. Yeah, and you have to understand, friends. Immediately after Magellan, the Spaniards called that bay of uh, where the battle took place. You know what they called it? No. Punta Engaño. Punta Engaño is a place, a point of deception. Oh, wow. Point of deception. <laughs> the Spaniards were deceived because that's the, the most strategic place for right. a battle to take. And that's the idea of Lapu Lapu. See right. the military. The yeah. Yeah, genius of Lapu Lapu. Oh, my gosh, man. Yeah. I mean, if there's anything, we can still be very proud of him being our national hero. That's right. Just based that's on right. that alone. That's right, that's based, right. based on that alone, right. that his strategy, 
he fought with that's this, right. not really with this, you know. That's right. Oh, that's right. God, that's, that's so right. amazing. That's, right. yeah. uh, that's so that just destroyed all my other questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it, it just it just so you know it, it it I mean one of the tenets of Filipino martial arts, and yeah. and I'm not and again there's no direct connection. I understand that, and I'm not making that as a conjecture. But I think the mindset of the Philip uh, of Lapu Lapu might have passed down. Who knows, right? Who knows? But the, one of the most important aspects of Filipino martial arts is efficiency in movement. Don't yeah. do more than you have to, or economy in motion. Don't don't take 20 steps if you can do it in two steps, kind of thing, right? Yeah, that's but that's clearly, true. that's the way Lapu Lapu thought also. Yeah. You know, he, yeah. he was like, oh, please don't attack us at this time. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. I'm just, yeah, no, no, please, Magellan, don't attack us at this time. Yeah. And don't attack us there. That's the worst yeah, place right. to attack us. And yeah. and so I can then understand why a lot of the early Philipp early people of that time would assume that the the, the Spaniards were a little arrogant because they, well yes in some way yeah yeah because they felt I mean you know if Lapu Lapu told them don't attack them now because we're still waiting for That's right. That's right. they That's felt right. like okay we're so superior you know yeah. there's there's, a, yeah. there's an air of superiority and and let's face it the whole idea of Christianizing the world. Is yeah. come from an air, uh, you know, a side of arrogance. Where, yeah, that's true. That's true. That's you true. know, there is a side of arrogance to that that the Lord has has yeah. given them this mandate to that's Christianize true. the whole world. It's either that's by true. faith or by sword, diba, yeah, Which is ironically what a lot of the Muslims did as well. Was like you either you, you know they they put the the scimitar around their neck and say you either believe or you or you or you die, kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, so, um, so this is absolutely amazing. Now, can I ask you something on a personal level, Professor? Yeah. Sure, you had mentioned Francisco Serrano, as you yeah. probably already know that my name is Francis Serrano. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and <laughs> I've, I've actually talked to my mother who uh, told me uh, many, many moons ago that somebody actually approached them about part of that, that there is a Francisco Serrano that was part of that story. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, my mom doesn't remember who that, that, um, that, that, that historian was. Um, he said that he was writing a, they said that they were writing a book, but they never found out what that book was or anything like that. And unfortunately, my father passed away back in 1995. Yeah. So, uh, and then I don't really, and then my grandfather passed away during World War II. Yeah. So I don't really have any more direct connections to my paternal side of my family. Can you explain who this Francisco Serrano was and what was his role within this, in this storyline? Yeah, yeah. Francisco Serrano was actually a Portuguese uh, captain. One of the captains in the uh, the uh, Portuguese uh, camps in uh, in the spies uh, in the in Malacca, and uh, he was a very very good friend of Magellan. In fact, when Magellan returned already to Lisbon, uh, Francisco Sirao, as we as the Portuguese would pronounce his uh, surname, Francisco Sirao, although it's, uh, in Spanish he was Serrano. Uh -huh. uh, Serrano or Sirao would send letters to Magellan. Uh, encouraging Magellan to go to the Spice Island. He said, oh, there's so much wealth here. You can settle here. You can, yeah. And the reason for that trance is because Francisco Zirao was appointed a sort of a field marshal by one of the kings of the clusters of islands in uh, the, uh, somewhere in Ternate and the Spice Islands. Okay. So he enjoyed a sort of a political and military power in that area. Wow. But unfortunately, because of these internecine wars among these small kingdoms there, Sirao was eventually killed, so mm -hmm. he did not live too long to see what happened to Magellan uh, uh, when he embarked on his expedition to the east. So he was in the which island was he again, Professor? Uh, I think he was. It was Ternate. Somewhat, but I, I've checked it uh, specific Francis. I forgot because there were clusters of islands where one of the kings there had uh, appointed him. So he did not join the Portuguese uh, army anymore, but he uh -huh. remained in the one of the islands there in. Uh, in uh, the Spice Islands. Uh, okay. Yeah. If you can, if you can help me, like sure. get resources, I would, I sure. would definitely sure. like to know more about that. Um, sure. Because from what my mother told me, and and she's not Serrano, of course. Um, yeah. But from what she told me, from what the historian told her, that um, that La, that that Francisco Serrano was related to Magellan. Yes. And, uh, there were some rumors. It's not very, very clear, but then there were some rumors. Some chroniclers would say that they were cousins. Okay. So, yeah, they were cousins. Got it. Oh, my pen died. Uh-oh. 
what happened? Sorry, Professor. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Right, technical sorry. difficult. Yeah. Technical Take your difficulties. time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Take your time. So there were cousins. Okay. Yeah. Wow, it's not writing. Okay, I'm just going to type it then. Sure. Okay, wonderful. Um, professor, thank you so much. Thank oh, you, thank oh. you, thank you so very much. I mean, again, you know, this is this is something that the Lapu Lapu's legend has grown bigger than than what the data supports, yeah. and as yeah. well as Magellan. I That's mean, right. unfortunately, I mean, not unfortunately, but you know, these two are definitely tied in history together. Yeah, you yeah. know, uh, you can't talk about Lapu Lapu without talking about Magellan, and you you, you definitely right. can't talk about Magellan without without talking about Lapu Lapu yeah. anymore. And then that yeah, yeah. these are two are very two intertwined within, especially within within our history of the Philippines. Yeah. So yeah, thank by the way, Francis, uh, just one final word about just to connect this with your question earlier about the myth of Lapu Lapu as uh, uh, in martial arts. I think the connection. Yes. I think semiotically, symbolically, so to speak, uh, physical symbols, uh, semiotic. Lapu Lapu was connected as sort of uh, the 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 founder in some way of martial arts, Filipino martial arts, right. because of a certain symbol that Lapu Lapu had, the use of pestle, pestle, mortar and pestle. Hold on, I'm going to write that down. Yeah. The Visayans call it alho, uh -huh. alho, the pestle uh -huh. that uh, that. Um, uh, that uh, long tube, tube uh, um, wooden tube in some way that they use to unhasp palay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It is said that Lapu Lapu became expert in hitting coconuts because of this pestle. So he does not use sword. Uh -huh. He used this pestle to strike coconut trees and they would collapse because of his tremendous power and his precision to hit a target. Oh, wow. Because of that, yeah, because of that, I think a certain mayor of Mactan built a monument of Lapu Lapu holding a pestle, uh -huh. a, a, a wooden tube like that, uh -huh. and it apparently looked like an arnis. Oh, wow. But, yeah, but bigger in our, in terms of its uh, cylindrical shape. Right, right, right. So it's probably because of that, Francis, that people later on thought that it is actually a weapon, that it's actually a product of a certain myth. And it is said that when the monument was built there, it is positioned towards the office of the mayor of uh, Mactan. Uh -huh. Since then, the mayor died, and there was a legend that as long as the monument was there, officials of the municipality will die because it is directed to them. The oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so they eventually uh, demolished that particular monument because oh, of that thing that it, yeah it's not going oh, so essentially okay. the connection is that pestle it was connected with uh, the, a sort of like an arnis kind of a, of a weapon but it's actually a pestle which emanated from a certain myth that la lapu lapu possessed power through a certain pestle given to him by his father mangal who also possessed an amulet, and supposedly all the rest were actually a product of either fiction or of uh, legendary imaginations. Well, I mean, the whole idea of of uh, anting anting is very yeah, yeah. ingrained within within our culture. You know, yeah, that in true. itself is a subculture within the Philippines. Uh, right, you know, right, of, right. of people with anting anting, you you uh, faith healers and stuff like that. Yeah, and uh, so that I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. And yes. if we were talking about, like you were saying, that after Lapu Lapu defeated Magellan, and then exactly. he is now favored by the gods, you know, that's right. That's yeah. the whole. That's the whole idea about amulets, right? This is that's right. This is that's the right. thing that God gave you to protect that's yourself, right. you know, that's kind right. of stuff. And you know, we have um, multiple stories. Uh, for that's example, right. Tatang uh, Ilustrissimo of wearing a vest underneath his clothes. That, right. that that had those 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 writings that's that protected that's right, him, that's right. That's you know, right. and uh, belts that they were yeah, they were right. given, you know. That's right. Um, that's right. This is why you know the whole legend about Filipinos. That's why the Colt forty five was invented, was that's because right. yeah, because Filipinos were they, they were not being killed by bullets. That's right. You know? that's so right. <laughs> so yeah, there, yeah, yeah. there 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 there's a lot of 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 that they needed more stopping power uh, right. and whatnot. You know, so those were the those were the conjectures that we were. They were hearing all about, but yeah, I mean, the whole idea of 
I mean, when, when things doesn't make sense, you try to find some sort of logical right. explanation yeah, to things. And, right. and then if all the, all you have is like, cause God likes me more than he likes you. I mean, that's, it just right. boils down. To yeah. <laughs> so wonderful. No, I did not hear about the, the what was it? The, what was that called again, professor? Yeah. That's what, that's what was that called again? The one that the Lapu Lapu was holding? Like, yeah, it's it a, like pestle. a pestle. A they call it alho, alho, pestle. Uh, yeah, pestle. pestle. Mortar and pestle, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let me write the that science called that alho. Alho? Alho. A L H O. A A L H O. Yeah. Thank you. This this is wonderful. This is absolutely very informative. Professor, thank you very, very much for your yeah. time. Thank you for sharing and thank you for doing the research. That's because right. Thank this, you. this is this is absolutely amazing. So everybody, I want to say thank you again to Professor Danny right. for, for sharing his wonderful wealth of knowledge with us, right. even though he didn't have to, but we're, we're very grateful. Maraming salamat, Professor. Maraming salamat, Francis. a pleasure being well, here. Well, folks, I mean, what did I tell you? I mean, there was definitely a lot of information that was shared, a lot of things that was, that was like, for me, you know, kind of stuff. Like, what the heck are you talking about? The Puente Engaño? Man, that's an amazing... Amazing story. So I hope you guys enjoyed. I'm going to try to get Professor Danny Girona to, to be interviewed again in the near future. Uh, but I don't know. Do you guys agree? Do you, did you like the what, what Professor Girona said? Comment down below. Um, you know, and if you have any questions, please post it on the, on the comments down below so that I can ask him that the next time I schedule something with him. Now, until then, please don't forget to hit like, share, and subscribe. And don't forget that notification button so you're aware of the next videos that drops in 413 Media Group and Filipino Martial Arts School. Until then, my name is Guru Francis, Big Boy Screamador. Peace out, God bless, and keep swinging them sticks.